Hello, good morning. You are watching the final Sophie Ridge on Sunday. The exodus in Westminster continues, with Ben Wallace saying he's going to quit the cabinet at the next reshuffle and parliament at the next election. And the fact he was once talked of as a future leader, I think, tells you an awful lot about the mood within the Conservative Party. So we'll be covering all the latest political news on the programme today, which is my last Sunday show. And it's been a wild ride. Brexit, Covid, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss. After our summer break, it's going to be the absolute legend that is Trevor Phillips, who will take over the seat at the front of the roller coaster and who's going to be on the show later today. But the bad news for you guys is that it's going to be even more of me on your screens because I'm going to be launching a new 7pm politics show on Sky News every weeknight, the Politics Hub with Sophie Ridge. Um, it's hard to find a way of saying this without it sounding really cheesy, but I actually do mean it really sincerely. It has been an absolute honour for me that you've made me part of your Sunday morning routine. And I would love it if from September you'd give the new show a try as well, maybe with a glass of wine though, rather than a cup of coffee. Anyway, to the important stuff. Let's crack on the guests on the show today. Our lead interview this morning is with the former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, on everything from the future of the NHS and wider public services to AI technology and the BBC. The Business and Trade Secretary has just signed a deal that allows the UK to join the Asia-Pacific trade bloc, billed as the most significant trade deal since Brexit. We'll be speaking to Kemi Bagnock live from Auckland a little later. For Labour, we are going to be talking to the Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds. Now, strikes have dominated a lot of the last year. No one's been a bigger thorn in the side of ministers than this man, the RMT union boss, Nick Lynch. He's going to join us live here in the studio. And with Defence Secretary Ben Wallace joining lots of other Conservative MPs, calling it a day at the next election, we'll talk to the former Environment Secretary who is doing the same, George Eustace. Good morning. Well, let's start this final show looking not to the past, but to the future. This week, I sat down with the former Prime Minister, Sir Tony Blair. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a minute, he's a former Prime Minister, isn't he the past? Well, there's not many people with as much influence on what could be the next Labour government as Tony Blair. Far from taking it easy since leaving number 10, he continues to work on policy and he has a really big influence on Labour thinking. This week, Keir Starmer is going to be talking alongside him at his conference on the future of public services in the UK. So I spoke to Tony Blair this week to talk to him about that and plenty more. I just wanted to start off with domestic politics, if I may. How worried are you about the state of the economy? Uh, very. If you look at the figures, um, our growth and productivity rates are, have been very poor over these last years. We're spending more than, well, probably I don't know, since the 1940s, taxing more, um, and the outcomes are poor. If you look at the health service, criminal justice, you know, so no, it's, it's a very difficult situation. Now, lots of other countries have, have similar problems, but I think ours are, are, are worse. Do you think people realise how bad and difficult things could be in the years ahead, with mortgages, with cuts, potentially? I think people realise how bad it is. And, you know, to be fair, I think the politicians realise how bad it is. The question is what you do about it. And, you know, in our conference this, this coming week, what we want to do is focus both on what you might do in the short term, and by short term I mean over one parliament, and then the longer term question, which I think is all about the technology revolution. I'm really keen to talk about those points first, um, but just on the economy, Labour, of course, need to prove, as always, to voters that they can be trusted on the economy. And Gordon Brown famously said he would stick to the Conservative spending plans for the first two years in 97. Do you think it would be sensible for Rachel Reeves to do similar? Well, I think Rachel will make her, her judgment on that, but I think what she has done in the last few years is really restore Labour's economic credibility, and that's incredibly important. And the truth of the matter is that it's going to be a very difficult situation for Labour coming in. And that's, that's the challenge. The, the challenge is, unlike in 1997, I mean, in 1997, it was obvious the country needed a big programme of social and liberal change. We had, I think, only 10% of the MPs were women. You know, gay people didn't have equality. Uh, there'd be no black cabinet minister. We didn't have a mayor of London. We didn't have devolved... A, a, Parliament or Assembly, there was no peace process in Northern Ireland, no minimum wage. OK, it, we get it, we right. get it. <laughs> but the point is, there was lots for us to do that, if you like, were, were things that didn't cost money to do. 
Well, you had money though as well, didn't you? Let's be honest. You had growth. You had uh, debt levels were, I think, 37% in 97, now well over 100. Right. So the economy, having gone through a difficult patch, to be fair to John Major and Ken Clark, the thing was much more stabilised. So we had to keep the economy going. And you spent money. You, you, know, you increased education spending by 83%, health spending more than doubled yeah, in real time. terms. Yeah, yeah, we did over time, exactly. So, so our task was to rebuild the public realm and keep the economy moving along properly. And, you know, we made significant economic changes too, but the point I'm making is exactly the one you're, you're implying, which is it was a lot easier for us. Labour's coming into this time into a much, much more difficult situation where everything is constrained. And therefore, the question is, it's, it's not just what do you do, I think it's what do you do to offer hope to people? Because otherwise people think, okay, it's grim and maybe we should put the Conservatives out, but what is Labour gonna do for us when it comes in? And this is where I think the big challenge is, but I think it's a challenge that Labour can meet. I mean, I guess my big question is what does a Labour government or a progressive government look like if there's no money left? What, what, what does that look like? Yeah, so I think there are, we've identified four things we think you could do over one parliament, leave aside all the technology stuff, which is longer term, but some of it could be done immediately. But the four things you could do immediately that would help, you could reform our planning system, which is a huge problem, by the way, means there is no possibility of this country meeting its climate change targets at the moment. I mean, absolutely zero possibility. Okay, so reforming the planning system would be a big economic boost. So basically, local concerns and yeah, you're going to have to take a decision. If these national infrastructure projects matter, and remember, we're as a country, even with a conservative government, saying we're going to more than double electricity within a decade. You know, it's, we, we will go through some of the figures next week and just show people the gap between what we've promised and the reality is massive. So there's planning. Um, then you've got uh, changes in the investment rules, which we've set out recently as to how you get much more money flowing from our pension funds into investment in British infrastructure and British companies. You've got to deal with the labour shortage problem, and then you've got to fix the Brexit relationship. So, you know, those are four things that would take you some time to do, but would, I think, have an immediate impact on growth. But the big question for the future is technology. And you've got some ideas on that as well, um, particularly on the health service, I was quite interested to see. Yeah, the, if, if you look at healthcare today, it's, it's going to undergo a complete revolution. You're going to be able to diagnose diseases and conditions much earlier. In fact, actually, you better do a lot of it from birth through, through um, genetics. You're going to be in a situation where people can manage their own conditions. You know, we all got used to testing. Uh, during COVID testing ourselves, but actually there's going to be a lot more that you can do. AI is going to transform things like radiology. I mean, a whole lot of processes within healthcare uh, can be digitized. And then AI is also going to mean that you're going to develop many more cures and treatments than we have now. So you, you've got the, the whole question about healthcare is how do you reimagine it so that it operates on a completely different basis. So you switch from treating illness, which is why the health service was, was created, to, to prevention and well-being. We often you know, talk about the NHS in quite a sort of starry-eyed way, if you like. Do, do you think that actually it is providing a good standard of care, if you look at international comparisons? Uh, no, at the moment it's, I mean, in some respects it is, obviously, the staff do a great job in difficult circumstances. And I think the general experience of people is that if, it's, if you're in really acute difficulty, uh, then, it, then it still does provide very good care. But a lot of the you know, waiting lists are, are terrible. Um, COVID, of course, has made it all worse. No, we, we've, but the truth is, you're not gonna have a lot more money to spend. But you do have to think, how do we do things completely differently? I mean, doing things completely differently, that's a big task for the NHS. Do you think there should be more private sector involvement? Well, there should just be a, there should be a, a complete cooperation between public and private sector in two respects. Obviously, you can use capacity that's in the, the private sector as, as it did we did when we were in power. But I think there's another thing that's going to be really relevant. A lot of these innovations, particularly innovations that, you know, like the wearables, okay, that, that people have and, the, and your ability to offer probably you know, what, what you might call low complexity but high volume things, a lot of it can be offered through the private sector. 
Um, but so we it shouldn't should... be a dirty word then? No, of course not. Because, you know, the, the problem always with the public sector, and this is what I learned in government, is the tough thing is to get it to innovate. Okay, because in the private sector, if you don't innovate, you go out of business, but it doesn't happen in the public sector. So the question is... Do you think the NHS would have got out of business by now? Well, the, the NHS is a great institution in its principles in which you keep those principles. But the truth, I mean, you don't have to be a, you know, a genius to look at it and say it's not, it's not serving its purpose. And by the way, the numbers of people we've employed in the health service has risen, not fallen. Um, what about um, you also talking about um, AI and the challenges of AI more widely as well, it often feels to people like AI can be a bit of a scary thing. Do you think we should be embracing it more? Um, well, you know, I asked someone who's an expert in this the other day, and I'm not, but I said to me, so is it good or is it bad? And he said, it's good and bad. He said, it's like any general purpose technology. It's, it's like fire or, you know, nuclear Power. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad, but the, it's a fact. And, and here's the thing that I think is really important for politics, because, you know, I, I spent a long time in politics, I was 10 years prime minister, so I have a reasonable experience in politics, but this is what happens to me when I talk to a lot of politicians, not just here, anywhere, about technology. And they say, yeah, it's really interesting. And now let's get back to talk about politics. Yeah. And I'm saying to them, no, because you've got to understand, this is the equivalent of the 19th century industrial revolution. It's going to change everything. It's not something that you think about at the end of the day when you've done your proper day job in politics. This is the mission. And for people on the progressive side of politics, it is the mission. It's the only way you're going to reignite optimism, transform the state, make it work more effectively and more cost effectively. And here's the other piece of good news for Britain. In this technology space, we have real advantages, big advantages, and we've got to preserve them and, 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 and you know, develop them. But it's not just the answer to how you reimagine how the state operates, it's also this is the future for the British economy. At the beginning of the section when we were talking about what the conference was about, things that a new government could do, you mentioned Brexit. And some people would say, look, part of the reason, not the whole reason, but part of the reason that our economy is doing badly is because of the knock-on causes of Brexit. Do you think a Labour government should pursue a closer relationship with the EU, given that Keir Starmer's ruled out rejoining the single market and the customs union? Yes, I, I, I do. So you, you've got rejoining, mm -hmm. which I think is very difficult. Um, rejoining the EU, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, rejoining the EU. And the reason it's very difficult is that we've spent seven years completely diverted in government from dealing with a lot of the big issues because we've had to deal with Brexit. I think, I mean, I would love it if it never happened, obviously, mm -hmm. you, you, you know that, but I think if you were to go back into a, a negotiation, actually go fully back into the EU at this, at this moment in time, a future generation, you know, that's another matter, but I think it would be a huge diversion for the, the, the government. But the second thing is, I think this country is only going to be ready to rejoin when it's strong. Mm. You, you don't want to go back into the European Union on, on your knees. There are, there are other things you could do, though. How no, about absolutely. rejoining the customs? So we, recently, we published a paper that set out a whole lot of things to give us a closer relationship with Europe, including aligning with the regulatory framework in, in, in Europe in areas where British business wants us to do so and then in cooperating in other big areas around energy but we and have climate. But we have to be real, right? You, mm. you said that right now we're in a weak position. Why would uh, the EU give us a deal where we can just cherry pick the best bits? Surely they're going to say, OK, if you want to rejoin the customs union, that means X. If you want to rejoin effectively the single market, you're going to have to accept more immigration from the EU, more yeah. payments into the budget. Do we so, need to be real about that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very good point. So you're going to have to put this together with a whole set, set of things where we're also doing things that Europe's going to find attractive. And what do you think we should be willing to compromise on there then? Well, I don't think it's, it's so much a matter of compromising and saying where are the areas that, that Europe's going to want us to work with them. And there you can see a, a lot of them, for example, science, which is one of the reasons why it's so important we rejoin this Horizon programme. There are things that we can do with Europe and for Europe that, that will help. Also, Europe itself, I think, you know, it also recognises now that the loss of Britain is a, is a problem for Europe, and, and it is. And when you look at this technology space, the absence of Britain from the room 
where Europe will decide its regulatory policy for artificial intelligence. Would you, would you, would you accept free movement of people? Um, well, you're not going to go back to do that unless you go back into the, the single market. But I do think for labour shortages in certain areas, we should be making it much easier for Europeans to come here and to work here. Um, I'm interested to get your thoughts on Ukraine, uh, if I may as well, because I know that you're interested in international stuff as well, of course. What do you think the end game in Ukraine looks like? Mm, well, it's a difficult question, I know. Yeah, it's... So I think there are, <clears throat> there are two issues. The first is what is Ukraine's relationship with the West, NATO membership, European Union membership, and the second question is what do you do about territory? And I think it's you know, extremely difficult to see how you get a solution to this unless it's very clear that Ukraine has a clear path to European Union membership and a clear path to NATO membership. And I think probably people will wait and see what happens out of this Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, and, you know, the Ukrainians have done an extraordinary job in defending their country and, by the way, defending us by defending their country. But I think it will be how you, you, you deal with those two issues together. And it's, uh, this is going to be extremely difficult, but I do think once we take stock after the counteroffensive, we've got to see if there is a way to bring it to an end with a negotiated end to it. And do you think territory may have to come into that? Well, I think territory is going to be the most difficult thing because Ukrainians will never accept that the territory that, I mean, from an international community point of view has been taken wrongly from them should be left with, with Russia. So this is going to be the most difficult thing for sure. This US election next year, Donald Trump looks the most likely candidate for the Republicans. We know what his view is on Ukraine. You can very much see him pulling American support. Um, do you th are you worried that the US backing for Ukraine may start to dry up next year? I mean, I hope, I mean, I don't know, but I hope that a Trump presidency would not mean that, even if that were to happen, because it would be completely disastrous if America withdrew its support from Ukraine. And I think the way that President Biden has managed to marshal support for Ukraine and keep people pretty much on the same page has been, you know, a significant act of statesmanship. So I, I, no, I hope that's not the case. But, but because let's be clear, I think the other thing just to say this to you about Ukraine, I think the most important thing talking to Ukrainians, and my institutes had a project in Ukraine for many years, they want an end to this, which is on terms that make it clear that no Russian president, not this one or any successive one, can ever come back and do this again. And I think that will be the overwhelming desire in Eastern Europe as well. So for that to happen, that American support has to be firm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I want to finish with a question that I think might make you roll your eyes, okay? Um, but I don't know what your thoughts on it, so I'm, I'm quite interested to know. Okay. Um, Hugh Edwards. What's your take on how that story's been handled? Well, I, I'm not going to roll my eyes, but I don't... I honestly don't know the... F I, don't, I don't think anyone knows the facts. And I feel sorry for everyone involved. You know, these are very, very you know, human situations. And, and you know, obviously, like, like you, I've known him for, for many years. I, I, I don't really have any great insight. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I just... I hope it all gets resolved in a way that, you know keeps people keeps people in good health and, and resolves whatever issues that have happened. But I don't really... I'm not an expert on this. I, I understand. Um, I guess there are sort of wider questions about the BBC, and there's kind of two perspectives here. One is that the BBC is effectively stumbling from crisis to crisis, and the other is that actually there are other institutions who have got the BBC in their sights. They're kind of gunning for the BBC, if you like. And I just wonder, what's your view here on the BBC? So my... My view on the BBC is, and I've had my run-ins with the BBC is... Yeah, we know, yeah, well documented. Know, um, but I think it's a great British institution. And I, I mean, of course, these things will happen from time to time, but I don't think it means that the whole of the BBC is now a bad institution. And I think, you know, frankly, the BBC should stand up for itself a bit more, to be, to be blunt about it. And also, by the way, abroad, the BBC is still regarded as an important British institution. And given our need to make sure we keep as much of our position of power in the world as we can, you know, I'm, so whatever my you know, disagreements from time to time, 
no, I'm, I'm, I still basically support it. Um, and then just finally, I think it's 16 years since you were Prime Minister, and whenever I interview you, there is some burning political issue that you want to talk about, whether it's testing during COVID now, whether it's the impact that artificial intelligence is going to have on the UK and the world as well. Do you find it a bit hard to let go? <laughs> it's not, I've, I mean, I've had to let go. I mean, but, but it's... Not You're not that. chillaxing in the shepherd's hut though, right? No, no, that's never going to be me. So it, it's, but I'm fascinated by the world. And the single thing that is in a way most um, strange and almost a little, at times it's a bit shocking, is how much I've learned since leaving office. It's a fascinating world out there. And if I've any, so I say this to any young people I meet in Britain today, go and learn about the world, because the biggest risk for a country like Britain, especially given our history, is that we, you know, we, we become insular. We don't understand how fast the world is changing and how absolutely vital it is to understand those changes. Because if you can't understand them, you can't make them work for you. Given you've learned so much since you've left office, if you could go back and change one thing that you did, what would you, what would you do? There'd be a lot, there'd be a list. <laughs> but, but I'm best to leave that to others to speculate on. OK, thank you very much. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, my interview there with Tony Blair. Now, right now, it's getting late on a Sunday night on the other side of the world in New Zealand, where today the Business and Trade Secretary has signed the most significant trade deal since Brexit. Now, that is the UK joining the 11-country Pacific trade bloc, which is known as the CPTPP. Get that right? Uh, the thing is, the government itself says it's only going to add an $1.8 billion a year to the economy in 10 years' time. Well, I'm glad to say that Kemi Badenoch, who is fresh from signing the deal, has stayed up to talk to us at Live from Auckland. Thanks very much for being on the programme uh, today. So what benefits are you hoping this trade deal is going to bring? Uh, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, it's fantastic to be in New Zealand. I'm here severely jet-lagged, but uh, we've had a wonderful event signing uh, this trade deal. And one of the uh, really exciting things is just how much all the other 11 countries have been looking forward to joining. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is where most of the world's uh, global growth is going to be coming from. In about 2035, we estimate about 50% of global growth is going to be coming from that region. Uh, it's the fastest growing one. Half the middle class will be from there by 2050. And we've got a seat at the table. There are other countries who are queuing up to, to join. We've got there first. We will have an influence on new countries that are exceeding. So there's everything, to, there's everything to play for. This is great news for the UK. You say it's great news for the UK. Um, there are 11 members of the CPTPP. How many do we already have free trade deals with? 12 now. We're 12, because we're in. 12 now. How many of those 12 or the other 11 do we currently have free trade deals with? The content of the free trade deals that we have with those uh, countries is different from what we're getting with CPTPP. That's why it's called the comprehensive uh, as well as progressive agreements for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there is uh, one additional country, which is Malaysia, that we have no agreements whatsoever with. But it isn't just about whether or not we have uh, an agreement. We've got agreements with many different countries. It is about the size, shape and scale and the cumulative impact of things like rules of origin, which are pooled between um, this uh, trading bloc. I guess... What people will say is, look, I'm, I'm not sort of denigrating that this is a you know, good thing to be doing or whatever, but if there's only one country in this block that we don't already have a free trade deal with, how much impact is it really going to have? You're saying that it's going to bring in £1.8 billion in 10 years' time. I mean, the Man City squad value of the, is about £5 billion, pounds, just to put that in context. Is it really going to make that much difference? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, it is. It's going to make a significant amount of difference. And I think one of the things that uh, I have tried to do is make sure that people understand that that was a potential forecast based on what would happen if we did not join. The static modelling, that's not what we should be focusing on right now. Even within our department, we're doing lots of different uh, new modelling. What we should be doing is praising uh, the effort that it's taken to get us into this regional bloc. I remember uh, a few years ago, people in the UK were laughing and saying that this would never happen. This is showing that we are not isolated. The UK is looking outwards. We are not an insular country. I heard your interview with Tony Blair uh, just a moment ago about us not being insular. We're looking outwards towards the world. 
we have a seat at the table in the fastest growing region, countries are queuing up. And quite frankly, what's going to make a difference is how much we use this free trade agreement. And that's what um, I think I really want to impress upon you. If we keep telling everybody that this is not something that's worthwhile, it'll become a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have to stop doing this, uh, talking down our country. No other country does this. This is a fantastic deal. Uh, this is a great tr uh, regional trading bloc that we're joining. It has countries like Japan, Canada, Mexico in it, as well as uh, New Zealand and Australia, which I'll be going to tomorrow. So this is something that we really need to celebrate. Talking about looking outwards, um, how would you rate our chances of a trade deal with the US? The US is not uh, carrying out any free trade agreements with any country, so I would say very low. It all depends on the administration that's there. Different presidents have different priorities. Lots of countries have been looking to have a free trade agreement with the US, including us. But for now, they said that that's not something that they want to do, and we need to respect that. And instead, we're having other types of trading interactions and trading uh, deals with them. You can look at what's happened with the Atlantic Declaration from the visit that the PM made uh, to the US recently, you look at the trade dialogues, we're having a lot of the cooperation that we're doing on security, for example, looking at uh, economic coercion, the work that we do with Five Eyes, the work that we do uh, together uh, uh, with the G7 and G20 and other multilateral fora. So free trade agreements are great, but they're not the only tool uh, in the trade toolbox. There's a lot more that we can do, and we have to work with our partners uh, by consensus. We can't force them into things. It's what the two countries uh, or the two sides of the deal agree to. OK. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the Conservative Party, if I may. Um, ben Wallace has announced that he's had enough. He's standing Hello, down as Defence Secretary at the next I'm reshuffle. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Sophie. Apologies. I just wanted to talk about Ben Wallace, about uh, who has said that he is going to uh, stand Wallace. down as Defence Secretary at the next reshuffle and also uh, stand down as an MP at the next election. He was once talked up mm. as a future leader. Are things that bad for Conservative MPs? Well, I think uh, the fact that Ben has been uh, in politics for about 25 years means that we should be celebrating his career and not uh, worrying about it. The fact is that there have been many leadership contests and he's never thrown his hat into the ring. He has never expressed any leadership ambitions. What he has been is an amazing defence secretary, uh, incredibly capable, uh, one of the few people who had the foresight to predict what was going to be happening in Russia and Ukraine and making sure that we did our part to ensure that Ukraine was ready for it. Um, he's been a fantastic colleague to work with. I've really enjoyed working with him. Um, I'm sad that uh, he's stepping down, but I understand that public service is something that is very gruelling and draining, and I think that we should be uh, celebrating Ben's public service rather than trying to link it to unrelated issues. At the same time, though, it's not hard to see a bit of a pattern. I mean, you'll, you'll I guess, forgive us for trying to link it to some of the other issues in the Conservative Party. If you look at the polling, if you look at uh, some of the recent uh, by-elections, and of course a trio of by-elections coming up next week, if voters in three very different seats send a message that they want the Conservatives out, what, how do you think your party should react to that? Do you think you should just keep going with the plan or is it time to change tack? So uh, I'm not going to speculate on what the results of the by-elections next week are going to be. Obviously, we are not being complacent, but different, uh, different things happen uh, during by-elections than uh, during general elections. The fact is this government has a, a large majority, and what we need to do is, focusing on, is focus on delivering for the people of the UK. It is very hard for governments to win by-elections uh, when we've been uh, in power. This is more than midterms now. We've been uh, in office one way or another, whether in a minority government, in coalition, for about 13 years. So it's understandable if we're not necessarily winning by-elections. Obviously, there's everything to play for. I've been out campaigning uh, in seats like Selby. And what we're doing is reminding people about what our uh, objectives are. There's the Prime Minister's five priorities. We've got a plan. We've got something to deliver. And that's what we hope people will be focusing on. Some people are change, calling for a change of direction, though, in your party. Backbench is getting a bit restless, in particular on taxes. There are reports that the Conservatives are considering scrapping inheritance tax. Would that be something that you would support? 
Uh, we keep all taxes uh, under review. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have to tax anything. I'm afraid that that's not the way that we can uh, fund public services. But it's uh, the Chancellor's job to actually look at everything in the round. And right now, what we're trying to do is uh, focus on inflation. One of our five priorities is halving inflation uh, and making sure that inflation gets lower, stays low, is going to have a far bigger impact on most people's uh, discretionary income than uh, inheritance tax policy. And uh, remember one of the other agreements, what, pardon me, one of the other priorities is improving and increasing economic growth. That's to, partly um, my job. That's why I'm here in New Zealand, focusing on bringing in that money, that business, that trade into the UK to, by signing these, uh, these good trade deals. Sorry, just to jump in, if I may, um, it's always hard, I know, when we're not in the same room. Um, you just said there that in an ideal world, we wouldn't tax anything and that wouldn't be how we would fund public services. Is that what you actually mean? No, that's not what I said. That's, that's, that's not what I said. In an ideal world, uh, there wouldn't be any taxes, but you need taxes to fund public services. Right, I see. Taxes yeah. uh, are something that we need, the tax is something that we need to fund public services. But you're asking me about a specific tax policy, uh, tax is the Chancellor's area. My point is that inflation is the thing that's really going to make a difference right now, rather than speculating on taxes. People will always have a particular tax that they want to see raised or lowered or whatever. But right now, the reality is making sure that we help with the cost of living. And that's so do you think some of your colleagues perhaps need to get real on taxes then? Everybody has a right to an opinion. People are constituency MPs. They have lots of constituents making requests. I have lots of constituents asking me about various tax policies. We look at these decisions in the round. What is not right is to uh, speculate, uh, for me, uh, a Sunday evening about any particular tax policy that is for the Chancellor, and that's something which he makes decisions on and announces at a fiscal statement. You're being um, admirably uh, well behaved. I'm sure at number 10 we'll be very happy with the answers uh, that you've been given so far. I'm just interested because you obviously ran well, for the it's leadership. It's my job to be professional, Sophie. Sure. <laughs> you obviously ran for the leadership, and many people saw you as having, I guess, the standout campaign. Um, but in the end, you withdrew, you backed Rishi Sunak. You can be loyal to him, as you have been in the interview, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is this isn't necessarily your vision of conservatism is it that you are implementing it's somebody else's and i just wondered if there's anything that you would do differently or prioritize in a certainly slightly different way i'm not sure what you mean by uh this isn't my vision for conservatism the fact is we have a prime minister who is competent who is very serious who is dealing with the issues of the moment. People are always asking me about leadership. They've been doing so since the first day I became an MP. And the fact is that I have more influence now being business and trade secretary than I've ever had. And what I'm interested in doing is delivering for the people of this country and in supporting Rishi, making sure that we win uh, the next election. Yeah, people do ask you a lot about the leadership. Um, you're often sort of seen as one of two potential future candidates of the right of the party against Suella Braverman. Is it a bit um, frustrating or secretly do you quite like it? People are always speculating. It's a weird thing about politics. It's the only industry where the first day you start the job, people ask if you want to run the com uh, want, want to run the company. And I just think but that's it's what most people want to do, though, right? That's spending. what most MPs go into. It for. is, but, but Sophie, the, th the thing is, people spend so much time focusing on personalities. We never focus on the serious issues, and I think it's a distraction. We should focus on what we're doing now. Uh, the five priorities the Prime Minister has talked about, including economic growth, which is what I'm delivering, and I'm really excited that we've brought home the biggest trade deal since we left the European Union. And that's what I want to talk about. That's um, what you, you want to talk about that, that's what matters. But at the same time, after, you know, over a decade of Conservative rule, debt over 100% GDP, growth is 0.2%, inflation over 8%, mm -hmm. Keir Starmer out and about today saying he's the one who can be trusted on the economy. Are you a bit worried that voters might believe that? Um, no, no, I'm not worried, uh, because he might be saying that, but he doesn't have any ideas, he doesn't have any plans. The fact is, uh, you know, all over the world, there are serious issues with inflation. The pandemic has had an effect. The uh, war in Russia and Ukraine has had an effect all over. Even here in New Zealand, I'm talking to ministers here, and they're talking about inflation. They're talking about the cost of living crisis. We're all dis di discussing what we're going to do about it. All Keir Starmer has done is made up a new word uh, to describe things. He doesn't have any answers, so I'm not worried at all. You had, um, just finally, um, 
You had a very different upbringing to most MPs. Uh, you went to school in Nigeria, where you carried a machete. How did that prepare you for the knives at Westminster? <laughs> I'm not sure anything can prepare you for life um, in Westminster. You know, I used a machete because that's how we cut grass there. There are no lawnmowers um, in Nigeria when I was growing up. So um, it, you got very blistered uh, using, using them. But um, I think that actually growing up in a third world country just makes you appreciate what an amazing country the UK is. And I'm really proud to be representing it on, on the world stage. It's been one of my proudest moments today. So that's been quite fantastic. OK, Kemi Abnot, thank you very much indeed for being on the programme today. Thank you, Sophie. You're watching Sophie Ridge on Sunday. Two pretty different interviews uh, this morning and a lot still to come on the programme as well uh, today. We are going to be talking to the Chair Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, on what a future Labour government could look like. Plus, a little later, we'll hear from the General Secretary of the RMT, Mick Lynch, and we'll also get some immediate reaction from our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. We'll speak to Sam a little bit later on the show. Right, let's get a view from Labour now. We can talk to the party's Shadow Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, uh, who joins us now. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Mr Reynolds. Um, I'm keen to get a bit of your uh, no, reaction to... Good. Good morning. I'm keen to get a bit of reaction from you to our interview with Tony Blair. I'm not sure if you got to see it, but he said that right now the NHS is not providing a good standard of care and things need to be done completely differently, including, in his words, complete cooperation between the public and private sector. Do you agree with him? Well, it depends what that means in detail. So I think there is... I saw the bit where Tony was talking about the, the changes in terms of what innovation will mean, what the kind of technological improvements will mean, how people will manage their health care differently. I mean, there, of course, always been a, a strong collaboration between public and private in the NHS. I mean, GPs and pharmacists aren't directly salaried employees of the NHS. So it depends what people mean by the detail of that. But I agree with the point that things have to change. We have to take advantage of these incredible innovations. I think we should think of you know, the data the NHS has for all of us as a, as a population as a, as a resource that is as valuable as, for instance, the North Sea once was to us. We've got huge potentially competitive advantages here that other countries don't have. So I'm very much for that case for innovation, but of course that for me does mean at the heart of public NHS still delivered free at the point of use. I don't think Tony would disagree with that in any way. So yes, let's embrace that innovation, but explain to the public in specific terms what that will mean for them. I guess the wider point that he was making is what does a Labour government do if there's not much money left or no money left, if debt is high uh, as it will be uh, after the next election. Um, Keir Starmer is talking a lot about fiscal discipline today as well. But if you do stick to the spending plans that are currently projected by the OBR after the next election, if you were to win, I mean, that would mean austerity, wouldn't it? Don't you think you need to get level with people about what that but, means? No, I think Keir is put the case the country is in and levelled with the British people in, in fairly frank and admirable terms. But let me just take you through each, each bit of that question, Sophie. So, first of all, I don't think the Conservative Party will stick to Conservative spending limits after the election if they That's had the chance to do so, because I don't think those are credible party. Can documents Can we just talk about what moment. Labour would do, please? Uh, absolutely. But let me just say... Change is not. People who try and posit that the choice being between spending a lot of money and getting that transformational change, you only get one, that transformation, with that discipline. And if you look at the detail of Labour's plans, it's not just about where we do need to spend more money and where we said there'll be switch spends to do that. It's about things like reform of the planning system, which could unlock a huge amount of private investment. It's about reform of business rates. It's about how national grid operates so that businesses themselves can do the changes that they wish to make, about how we will change the apprenticeship level to give businesses more flexibility over the skills training they need for their employees, how we'll devolve some of that skills budget to local areas as part of our devolution plans. It's not just about spending money. Of course, there are areas where we accept, for instance, we've said we'd end the non-DOM rule and put the money into the NHS or we would tax private equity differently or, or put VAT on the fees of private schools. We have identified where additional resource will come from. But it's important people understand that change and reform is as much about our plans 
as that investment. And I would just say to anybody who disagrees with that, that belief in discipline that we've got on the Labour side, just look at the disaster of the Liz Truss government. It's not just about the government having higher borrowing costs, which is a problem. It's about people paying mortgages, paying more than they otherwise would have done because that government had no discipline and no serious plan. So I will stick very resolutely to our message of change, investment, but discipline is part of that. Yeah, but you need to be honest about what that discipline means. Because, yeah, sure, it means all the things that you're talking about when it comes to reform and changes to the planning law and so on. I'm not saying that isn't going to happen or wouldn't happen under a Labour government. And I'm also, uh, you know, you, you are talking about increasing taxes by a couple of billion here and a couple of billion there. But let's get real. It also means really, really tight spending along with those other two things that you make. And that, for many people, is going to look like austerity. We do not believe in austerity, and many of us witnessed firsthand the, the consequences of that in our constituencies. But we have always been absolutely clear. I mean, we've got to level with people, and we have done. If we don't improve the economic growth of this country, if we have the kind of stagnation and the low productivity and the wage stagnation that has really been the defining feature of the last 13 years, it does put incredible constraints on what you can promise and what you can change in terms of public services. So that's why our approach has always been to say, for instance, if you look at the, the combination of that programme, reform and public investment through things like our Green Prosperity Plan, that has always been about how do you leverage in a greater amount of private investment? How do you then see the improvements that will come to productivity and to growth as part of that? And if you just look specifically, I mean, I heard a little bit of the interview there with the, the current business sector. I mean, I would just say to her, where are the, the battery factories we need in this country to keep the automotive sector here? Where's the plan for green steel? In every country around the world, you're seeing these big collaborations between the state, the government and the private sector. And we haven't got the same level of ambition here in the UK right now. And that is why we're not seeing the kind of investment that we need to see. Um, this week, the government accepted the pay review body recommendations, uh, which means that for many unions, they've decided to call off strikes, such as in schools. Junior doctors are holding out, though. Uh, what's your view? Are they right to hold out for more money, or is it time for them to call it a day? Well, look, the, the situation in any bit of the public sector is going to have to be a decision for the unions and the workforce in that area. And the issues are different in each sector. We've always tried to get across that we understand specifically for the NHS, of course pay is an issue, but workload and burnout and retention are also massive issues as well. And I think a lot of people want to see the government acknowledge and recognise that. I do think if they followed our plan to, for instance, raise that revenue, it's not insignificant, three and a half billion pounds, and put that into the NHS in terms of workload. That is the kind of a serious proposal that the workforce will want to see. So th those individual workers will have to make that decision. But I think the government's got to recognise, I think it has recognised, to be frank, its early approach was completely wrong. And actually, you know, the lack of respect they've shown for a lot of the public sector, I think, has been one of the aggregating factors in the industrial action that we've seen. OK, uh, thank you very much indeed. Great to have you on the programme. Jonathan Reynolds there speaking to us. Now, a little later, we are going to be taking a trot back through the last few years on the programme and everything that has happened in the political world. It has been quite a ride, so I'm looking forward to that. But we can get a bit of immediate reaction to what we've heard this morning from our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Sam, you're in the studio because it's a big day for us. You haven't put a shirt on, though. Is this your Sunday attire? <laughs> yes, uh, as casual as ever, the content as serious <laughs> as ever. <laughs> I'm not in charge of what I wear. Uh, we have people that make me wear certain things on a Sunday morning and I follow their rules strictly. Of course. Uh, I'm not even going to go into uh, any of this. Um, what have you made of the uh, interviews this morning? It feels like the big kind of essay question, if you like, to Tony Blair uh, and really to Reynolds there as well, uh, is what would a Labour government look like in these difficult economic times. That's right, and I think that it is a moment to look backwards and forwards. The story for me that does that of the morning is the government's great big announcement about joining this Trans-Pacific trade deal. Have a look at the way that they want to present it to the world. They did so on the front page of The Express, announcing a £12 trillion deal that Kemi Badenot has signed up to. Actually, if you look at the uh, government's own figures, it's a bit more like 1.2 billion, 0.1% of, uh, 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 of GDP. Um, but I was looking around this morning at how you know, the Asian papers are reporting that. And, and, and they're much more muted in the way that they talk about it. Uh, for instance, there is um, 
That's how. That's what the government want you to see. But if we look over uh, at the next, uh, the next still, it actually the analysts are saying that the impact of this is largely cosmetic. Uh, that you, look at that. UK formally joined CP, TPP to little fanfare and low expectations. Ouch. And the analyst quoted says uh, the impact of this deal is mainly cosmetic for the UK to show that there are trade deals after Brexit. Nobody in Asia is talking about the pact very seriously. Two big questions for the future. One. This is a deal that they, this government have nailed, but not only what does it mean, what other deals are there? India, are we going to strike a deal with India? The EU is looking at that really closely because what does that mean for free movement? Is Britain going to allow more people in? And the second question is, I just don't really understand, I don't quite believe, in fact, everything the Labour Party is saying about how they will deal with trade deals in future. Do they want to pursue this path of the current government? Because every trade deal signed is going to have a massive impact on the country that they would inherit if they win the next general election. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, Sam, thank you very much indeed. We'll have more from Sam uh, later on uh, after half past, so looking forward to that. Now, the last year or so has been the stormiest for industrial relations in decades, especially in the public sector, with the governments pitted against doctors, nurses, teachers and others over pay, with some pretty bitter rows and strikes for months. Now, the dispute with rail workers is still ongoing. It's made a household name of Mick Lynch, the boss of the RMT Rail Union, who's become, uh, well, for some would say a pantomime villain, others would say star media performer and thorn in the side of the government. I guess it depends what type of side of the fence you're on. Uh, he's also been one of our most interesting guests, so I know I always enjoy uh, interviewing. Uh, joins us now. Uh, thank you very much for being on the programme uh, today. Good to have you with us. Um, so the government settles uh, with quite a few uh, public sector bodies now. No strikes, for example, in schools we're expecting. How's it going with you? Well, no contact. Uh, they seem to pick out the RMT as a special category where they can't negotiate on a reasonable basis. We're available to talk to them, but I don't think I've met a government minister since January. And even the employers now have stopped negotiating. So I don't know whether they're waiting for all this other stuff to be cleared out of the way. We don't know if there's going to be settlement yet. I think they're out for referendum and consultation with their members. We'll see. They've certainly offered the others more than we've been offered. There's no strings attached to those deals. We've got to accept the whole host of change and dilutions to our terms and conditions and job losses. 2,300 redundancies were announced last week just in station staff. So it's a very tough road ahead of us, but we're determined to keep our campaign going. And the public now is out in support to save our station staffing and ticket offices. And we're getting a massive reaction to that. Do you think that part of the reason why the government is, you know, hasn't met you again is because they see this as the final offer that they've offered you, I think it's, am I right in saying, pay rises of 5% and 4% more for the lower paid, no compulsory re redundancies, that's it? Well, they've withdrawn the no compulsory redundancies because they've put it into the companies. There's not national negotiations going on at the moment. I don't know if we'll get back to that. But they've got into each of the 14 train operating companies and there are no guarantees. They've issued 2,300 redundancy notices just in one, one group last week. So what they've said in the Commons is not true. The Minister stood up last week and said there'd be no redundancies. That is a complete falsehood. I've got the letters in my office that inform me of nearly a quarter of station staff being made redundant. So we're there to meet them. If they want to meet us, we'll meet up with them again and we'll look for, a, for an agreement. This has never been just about pay, as we've been saying consistently. It's about cutbacks, de-staffing and ensuring that the private sector operators maintain their profits as do they've you, done. Do you think or do you accept uh, that there needs to be some efficiency savings and reform when it comes to the railways? You know, the government would say, look, taxpayers have spent £31 billion on the rail industry in the last two years. That's £1,000 per household. Many of those houses don't even use them. Well, we always deal with change. There's not been a period in, in the history of the railway that's not been changed. Uh, and we will deal with any reasonable proposals. But what we want them to be is agreed, not imposed on top of us. And that's where the difficulty comes. They set down an agenda where our members must give up their contracts of employment, have them chopped to bits and go on basically uh, the uh, gig economy and, and versions of it. We can't accept that. We've, we've negotiated these, con these contracts over decades and we want to maintain them. And that's what most people in Britain want now. Most people in all sorts of industries, including this one, funnily enough, are furious about the way they're treated, put on casualised basis, put on agency work, zero hours contracts and all the rest of it. That's what we're fighting for, a better uh, balance in the workplace. And we hope we can get that coming forward through our actions, but through political change in the future as well.
political change in the future, you, what, are you a bit optimistic about a Labour government? Then you think it could be different? Well, I'm optimistic that we'll get rid of this government. This government's got to go. It's I mean, stumbling Keir around. hasn't said that much when it comes to you guys either, though, has he? Well, he has. He has at the TUC Congress. He's, his ministers have said that there'll be a new deal for workers. Have they said but, what that was going to be, though? Yes, they have. They've set that out in quite a lot of detail. There's a, at least 100 points of change in the new deal for workers from contracts of employment, repealing some of the anti-trade union laws, giving a better deal for trade unions, but also giving a better deal for individual workers. Now, we, we want that to happen. We want these anti-trade union laws to be abolished. We want better funding for the public services. That's going to be tough. But if he delivers what he said he's going to deliver, then that will be an improvement for most working people in this country. You start striking, I think, just over a year ago. Mm. Um, at what point do you call it a day? Well, when we've got an agreement. So, so you could strike for another year then, if, well, if you don't get don't, an agreement? We don't want to be on strike for, and on another occasion. We'd much rather get agreements in both London Transport and on the National Railway. But you'll but keep striking But we've got our two parties until... to get to it. Yeah, we will keep going in our campaign until we get a document that our members want to support in a referendum. No matter how long it takes? Well, I didn't want it to take this long, but we haven't got the agreement. So our members have renewed the mandate recently and there's strike action planned. If somebody wants to come to us with an offer that can get rid of that strike action so that we can consider uh, a new deal, then we'll, we'll take that on board. Now, it's been quite a year for you. I mean, you're basically famous now. <laughs> What's that like? Well, it's a bit of a look at the state of me. So it's a bit weird, somebody like me being uh, uh, getting a profile. I'm not interested in that. <laughs> I'm not... I'm can, not you still, uh... can you still go down your local pub without being recognised? No, I can't go anywhere without being recognised. Well, what, what sort in... of thing happens then? People want selfies, people want to shake my hand. I don't get any abuse, really, as going about the place. Maybe I do online. But most people say, even if they don't entirely agree with us, they respect the stand we've taken, that our members have taken, and they, they understand that somebody's put in a slightly different argument to the professional politicians, which I think is a bit of a shame. And it's a shame that Labour and others can't show that they're distinct from the kind of consensus that's got us into this trouble where working people are struggling. Uh, the cost of living crisis seems to be ignored by the political class to a certain extent. And you put everyone in that? Labour, yes, I do. I don't think Labour's or... doing enough. We will be critical of Labour when they don't do the right stuff and we'll be supportive on the occasions that they do. But at the minute, I think Keir Starmer and his team have got to show some clear water, some clear red water between themselves and the Daily Mail and the Telegraph and themselves and the, the Conservatives. And at the minute, many people can't spot the difference and that's a shame for somebody who's probably as, as talented as Keir Starmer is, he's got to show that he's on the side of working people and progressive politics, and I don't think we're seeing that at the moment. Why, why don't you think you're seeing it? Do you think it's because he is focused on winning the election or because he just well, doesn't really believe it? He's got five, what are they, missions. Nobody knows what they are. Nobody understands them. Nobody could remember the five missions. He should be saying something about workers' rights. He should be saying stuff about funding the NHS, National Care Service, looking after people who are struggling in the housing market, council houses for the masses, uh, controlling rents, uh, addressing all sorts of stuff about what's going to happen in the imbalance in our society. He's not saying any of that. He won't dare mention the word socialism. I want to hear that word mentioned frequently. And I want to see a redistribution of wealth in our society. Because there are a lot of very wealthy people and there are too many very poor people. And now the people in the middle are being squeezed as well with rents and mortgages skyrocketing. He doesn't seem to be on the side of the people of this country. I think he could be on the side of the people of this country, but he's got to show it to us before the election. OK, there you go. That's a, a rallying call, uh, if ever you heard one. Uh, Mick Lynch, thank you very much. Good to have you on the programme today. Thank you. Today. Uh, now, uh, there is a lot of change in the air here at Westminster. Uh, we're definitely picking uh, that up this morning as well. And if the polls are to be believed, there could well be a change of government as soon as next year, which means MPs thinking about their futures. Parliament's calling it a day for the summer next week. A lot of members are calling time on parliamentary careers. Many Conservative MPs have already announced they're not going to be standing at the next election. Uh, one of them is the former Environment Secretary, George Eustace. And yesterday, the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace, said he would also step down as Minister ahead of an elected, expected reshuffle. Well, George Eustace joins us now. Thanks for being on the programme today. Hello. Um, so you're not standing at the next election. Why not? Well, I will have done 25 years in politics in total by the time of the next election. Ten as an advisor... 15 as an MP and, and 9 in Parliament. And I think the days, really, of people staying as an MP, you know, for the whole of their lives, you know, are done. I mean, obviously, sometimes the electorate have different views anyway. But in my case, uh, I'll be 53 at the next election, and I wanted the chance to pursue a different career. So that's what I chose to do back in January. So I guess you understand where Ben Wallace is coming from this morning, then? 
Yes, and of course, Ben Wallace, remember, I think his seat is disappearing in the boundary review. And so, you know, when you have a boundary review, as we've just had, there are, will always be uh, some MPs, uh, Chris Skidmore's another one, whose seats literally just disappear. And they then have a choice about whether they try and secure another one or whether they take that opportunity to step back. I spoke to Kemi um, Maidenlock earlier in the programme and she said, look, you know, this is just because Ben Wallace has been in politics a long time. It's absolutely nothing to do with the state of the party and, and the polls. I mean, come on, it, that must come into it a little bit, right? It's a hard road ahead if you're a Conservative MP. Well, look, the prevailing polls uh, are challenging for us, that's right. And I think Rishi Sunak, though, is doing a tremendous job of keeping his nerve and really being industrious and working hard on some of these big challenges we've got. But I think you can also overinterpret these things. Let's not forget that in uh, 2019, I think there were about 79 MPs who stood down. And currently, there's about 45 or 46 that have decided to stand down. So every election, you'll get a lot of MPs that decide to stand down. There's perhaps a bit more focus on it this time. Uh, and people are uh, inclined to maybe overread the significance of it. OK. Um, um, I'll, I'll believe you. I'll, well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll maybe have a difference of opinion. Um, you've, of course, have got another electoral test coming up next week with these three by-elections. If the Conservatives do badly, we're expecting it to be challenging. How much of a wake-up call should that be for the government? Well, I think the important thing uh, when you have setbacks in by-elections is that you keep your nerve, actually, and stick to the programme you set out. I think Rishi Sunak's analysis is absolutely right, that there are big challenges in the global economy and we've got inflationary pressure uh, and we've uh, it's got problems... not just the global economy, though, is it? Because we are being disproportionately hit by this. Uh, well, it, it goes in cycles. So our growth was stronger than most G7 members, you know, a couple of years ago. It's now weaker because everyone's on a different part of the cycle. But I, I think he's right um, in his analysis that we just need to work through this, show credibility, uh, get the public finances in order. It's a difficult challenge, but there's no easy way back for us electorally. There's no... Um, popular thing that you can just say uh, and think that that's going to change uh, the polls. And I actually think a more significant uh, watershed moment could be uh, the party conference season. So the, the truth is the headline polls are what they are. Um, and therefore, I don't think these three by-elections will tell us anything we don't already know. But I think if I were advising Labour and I've advised oppositions in the past, I'd be a little bit worried going into the conference season because um, Keir Starmer really hasn't said very much about what he would do. Uh, he's had a lot of um, fine weather in which he could have uh, set out the foundations of what a Labour government would stand for, but he's chosen not to take that up. And I think, you know, his uh, poll lead and his uh, current position is looking a bit, you know, toppy, if I might say so, going into that party conference season. And you unless wouldn't people... want a poll lead like that, would you? Uh, well, you'd want a poll lead like that, but you'd want to make use of that poll lead to actually consolidate your position as a government in waiting. And I think Keir Starmer at the moment looks very complacent. He looks like he thinks it's going to just land in his lap, that he hasn't got to work for it, that he hasn't got to try for it, and hasn't got to uh, level with the public and tell them what he would do. Um, scrapping inter inheritance tax, you were talking there saying that there's no kind of big popular things that the Conservative Party can necessarily throw around, it is what it is. But, but what about that? Do you think that's the kind of policy that could win a few votes? Well, look, tax policy is always about choices. And the difficulty for me is, well, well, obviously, it would be nice to reduce inheritance tax. If you choose to reduce inheritance tax, you are choosing to keep alternative taxes higher. And um, inheritance tax basically benefits those people who can rely on the bank of mum and dad uh, if they want to buy their first home. I kind of think we also have to worry about those who don't uh, have the bank of mum and dad that they can uh, draw on. Uh, what about those who are working uh, from the ground up and don't have anything to inherit? Uh, we ought to maybe be thinking about the income taxes that they pay. Uh, what about those businesses that are currently lumbered with 20% VAT, which is a, a, you know, a huge burden on the growth of our economy and on those businesses' potential to develop? You know, we should probably be considering that as well. What about things like a transferable tax allowance so that we help uh, families with young children and support uh, women who choose to stay uh, and look after their children in those first few years of their life? We should be considering that. So it's all about choices. Personally, I would choose uh, other tax cuts that uh, support people in other areas okay. uh, over inheritance tax. But that doesn't mean to say, you know, we shouldn't do something and maybe look at the, the thresholds again. OK, thank you very much, Dude. Good to have you on the show. George thank Eustace you. Uh, there. Well, as I said at the top of the show, um, this is my final uh, Sophie Ridge on Sunday, uh, but there is going to be a new show on a Sunday morning here on Sky News starting in September, so don't worry about that. More about that to come. But first, um, I just want to take a little uh, 
roll back, shall we? Let's have a look back at the last six years. As you can imagine, a lot has happened in that time. Donald Trump tweeted last night that he's looking forward to meeting you next month. And I'm just very interested to know your feelings before that meeting, bearing in mind some of the things that Donald Trump said about women. Now, I'll probably feel slightly awkward reading this out, but I do think it's important to rehear what Donald Trump was recorded saying in the past, which is about women. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Grab them by the pussy. I mean, forgetting the fact that you're Prime Minister for a moment, how does that make you feel as a woman? Well, look, I think that's unacceptable. But in fact, Donald Trump himself has said that and has apologised for it. I've talked to a lot of people now in Boston, in the pubs and the cafes. They've been very frank about what they see as the negative side of immigration. And actually, some of their stories are pretty shocking. Fights, drug use, one woman even talked about someone going to the toilet in her front garden. But the thing is, although they're happy to talk about their personal experiences to me, what's really extraordinary, almost unprecedented, is that they won't say any of this on camera. So can you condemn the, the IRA? Who I've just condemned all those that were did bombing. In, all if, those, if you let all me those, finish as well, those on after both I've sides. just let you finish, that would be appreciated. All, all those on both sides that laid bombs. But would, can you condemn the IRA without equating the IRA, who are responsible for 60% of the deaths during the Troubles, with the British security services, who were responsible and for around 10%. And there were loyalist bombs as well, which you haven't mentioned. Yeah, 30%. There were loyalist bombs as well. I condemn all the bombing by both the loyalists and the but and Can the you just IRA. say... You, but you won't no, just said, talk no, about... Wait a minute. Them. I don't know quite what you're trying, point you're trying to make here. Do you think we can get a deal? I think allowing us and Britain to achieve the main objectives of the backstop. I, I don't have an erotic relation to the backship, uh, to the backstop. We're just here in Uxbridge today, um, Boris Johnson's constituency. Don't you ever mention that name in front of me, that filthy piece of toe rag. Thank you very much for being on the programme. My pleasure. Prime Minister. So you're, you're, you pitched the first December election since 1923. You're asking people to get out in the freezing cold and vote yes. for you. You better have a good pitch. I know. and I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to, to do it, but uh, we've got to get Brexit done. Can people on trust January you when it comes to Brexit? Because last month, you told businesses in Northern Ireland that they would face no forms, no checks, no barriers of any kind under your Brexit deal. And you also went on to yes. say that if anyone asked them to fill out a form, they should phone you up personally yeah. and you'll direct them to throw that form in the bin. Well, how come then that this government document that was leaked uh, this week yeah. says that that's not true, that there will be checks and forms? Were no, you we're... telling the truth? Yes, I am. And look at what we say in our manifesto, look what we're going to do, deliver. The, the deal that we've done so with the So will there be checks? No. Absolutely not. He didn't stay in the same place. The household is supposed to stay in the same place if you have coronavirus. His wife was showing symptoms of coronavirus at the time, and he didn't stay in the same place. Well, the, uh, I mean, he did once, once they, uh, you know, were locked down, they sort of hunkered down and they stayed there for 14 days. And yeah, that's after uh, they do travelled 260 the miles. Out, well, everyone has to sort of, you know, if, you, if you're going to lock down, you go to the place you're, you're going you're gonna to stay. We did. Uh, and it was actually about 150 years ago, I think, introduced a compulsory vaccinations uh, legislation in this country. And it led to mass demonstrations, actually. Oh, excuse me. Oh, no. Let, uh, oh. And the... Uh, this is... Um, if you need to take a moment, The equipment is falling over. The <laughs> umbrella is gone. Um, we'll come uh, back to you. This is going to be one of those ones... One, this will be one of those clips that will go viral, no doubt. Is it true that you've been talking to people in government, Matt Hancock, for example, and giving them some advice on handling the pandemic? Yeah, first of all, the, the stories that appear about this have nothing to do with me and I don't put them there. Yes, of course I speak to people in government. So, Lucy, you escaped Russia with somebody. Who did you escape with? Mr. Red. <laughs> Obviously, I know you want to speak for yourself, but so it's completely fine if you don't want to answer this question. But did his partner know about it either, I guess? No. And that must have been difficult for them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the point that I made is that, mm. uh, you know, if the law had been different, as it is in other countries, mm. as it's soon going to be in Scotland, probably, mm. judging by the mood there, um, he could have talked to us. We'd have planned together. He would probably have lived longer. I think he took the decision to go prematurely because he wanted to act while he still could mm. Mm. and if he'd been able to talk mm. we could plan together mm. he'd have lived longer mm. and being able to die with his family around him 
Thank you very much. No, not at all. Thank you for showing us story. It's so important. Mummies, when they were handing them over to strangers, saying just get them safe, they were telling, hold on, well, no matter what happens, hold on to your backpack. And then when at the refugee center, you are hugging this child and you are telling, like, give it to me, like, please, let's open up and watch what's there. And he's saying, no, mommy told me not to do that. Mommy told me to do to, to this. And do, would I ever see my mommy again? And then when you open up, you know, like the same, same thing it probably that happened during the world, Second World War when they were writing down like the small things, like saying, mommy loves you. This is his last name, first name. This is his paperwork. This is our address. And please, 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 please make him safe. This is what I want for Ukrainian children to make them safe. Sorry, I, I'm still not really clear. Um, you say you weren't aware of any reports. Uh, you say that everyone is passed on for vetting if they, you know, become, uh, are given a position. W was the Prime Minister aware of allegations around Chris Pinch's behaviour when he was made Deputy Chief Whip in February? Things were referred, uh, but nevertheless, uh, when somebody phoned the Prime Minister, uh, particularly on Friday, I think it was, um, he agreed with the Chief Whip that this uh, whip should... Uh, the whip should be suspended. Sorry, I, don't, so, I, don't, I, I, I genuinely don't understand that sentence, that um, it was suggested and things were referred. I, I don't, w what does that mean? Well, I think it's been well laid out, um, Sophie. We're, we're talking about what it says here in the ad. Do you think adults convicting, uh, convicted of sexually assaulting children should go to prison? Rishi Sunak doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I, Is that I think, what you think? I think if he did think they should go to prison, he'd do something about it. So you don't think he thinks paedophiles should go to prison? Is that what you're seriously saying? I stand by the advert. Is that, so that's what the advert says? You're, yeah. Is that what you're seriously saying? Yes. If the complaint is upheld, will you resign? I'm not going to start speculating on uh, what the uh, outcome might be. Again, you're asking me to comment on the subject matter. I'm not asking you to comment you on are... the subject matter. I'm asking you to find out what, what you will do if It is a hypothetical question, Sophie, well, uh, so I've got I to... two different outcomes. Well, look, let's see what I the report says. I'm if, not in control. If you're clear, then you won't resign. So what will happen if you do, if you're not clear? Well, I, l allow me to respond in the right uh, way at the right time. Of course, look, if an allegation of bullying is upheld, I would resign. Well, it's been quite a ride. Uh, thank you to all our guests um, up for, you know, coming on the programme and, and at least they're, you know, facing up to stuff, which is always um, a positive uh, thing. But what a ride it has been. It really has. It's a huge, huge privilege. Great job. And I'm really delighted to say uh, that joining us now is Trevor Phillips, who is ready to receive the baton because he's going to be presenting <laughs> a new programme on Sunday mornings from September. Trevor, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful to have you. Sophie, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I, I must say, um, watching those clips, I'm already absolutely intimidated. Not only am I probably the <laughs> oldest apprentice ever in the world, I, I'm just watching what you've done. And um, if I can achieve half of that, I'd be very, very glad. Well, look, it, it just goes to, you know, one of... It, an absolute legend, one of the nicest guys in broadcasting as well. Like, you, you, honestly, like, and that just shows the sort of kind words that you said about me. It just goes to show that as well. I'm, I'm so excited to see what you're going to do with Sunday. Um, have you got any kind of thoughts on, on what that might look like? Well, uh, you know, there's a couple of things. Uh, one, um, I should just say, I've, I've never said this to you, but um, the interview you did with Paul Blomfield mm. was one of the most moving things I've seen on television. And that was important to me, because Paul and I have been friends since we were students. Um, and I know him very well, and he's not a guy who emotes. Yeah. So I, I think partly what that said was that in these kinds of settings, mm -hmm. giving your interviewer, interviewee the confidence to speak mm -hmm. is really, really important. I think, if I may say so, in a lot of modern interviewing techniques, um, I think a lot of interviewers think that the question is more important than yeah, the answer. And I one agree of the reasons, with that. <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm a viewer, of, I was all, being a viewer to your show, is that you've never done that. It's uh, and uh, so I think I want to carry. I'd like to carry that on. And I guess the other thing I'd want to say is that um, one of the great things about this show is that it recognises that politics isn't just what happens in Southwest One. Mm. I mean, it's a mistake that most politicians have made. Very, very painfully over the last seven or eight years, they think that what happens here is what really matters. But I hope what we'll be able to do is to take the opportunity to expand what we mean by politics. 
from what happens in the Palace of Westminster. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense, particularly at such an important time in, in politics. When you look at what's happening with the economy, uh, the real pain that people are going to be experiencing and some of those big questions ahead of the election, it's almost more important than ever, it feels to me, to, yeah, of course, who's up, who's down, this is all exciting, but actually there's some really important policy stuff to get stuck into as well. Indeed, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, 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 you know, it's probably the last thing I'm going to be able to say, which is my personal opinion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but it, was, it was really interesting watching you interviewing Tony Blair, who, to be frank, still talks as though he's the Prime Minister. But what I thought was really interesting was that he didn't talk at all about the issues of party and so on. He went into big questions, uh, AI, technology, what do we do about the NHS? And I think if we can provide more of a space to do, for politicians to do that, to be courageous and not always be looking over their shoulder at the bloke who might be looking for their job, then I think we'll be doing a service and we'll be distinguishing ourselves from uh, there are others available, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. If it. My sort of golden rule often with this interview has always been um, to allow people, as Trevor was saying, to have the space to answer the question, to give them, uh, you know, like you say, the question, the answer is more important than the question. But the only time when you are allowed to lay into them is when they don't answer that question. Yeah, yeah. And it happens um, more, as you all know, as, as viewers, uh, it happens more often than we like as well. So I'll be interested to see how you deal with that well, too. Well, I, I, I have to say, I, I laughed out loud and I, I rather loved it when you went back to Kemi Badnock this morning when she said, um, you know, I'm not making a judgment about whether this is right or wrong, but you never hear a politician say something like, I, 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 in an ideal world, we'd never have to tax anybody. Yeah, and I was like, hang on a minute, do you actually mean... <laughs> I was like, did you mean this? Like... I, yeah, I, lo I love the fact that you said, did you really just say yeah. that? And then she was like, I didn't say that. I was like, I, I think you actually did say it. Like, I'm pretty sure that is what I heard. That's why I'm coming back on you. Um, thank you so much, Trevor. It's Absolute a great pleasure. to have you here uh, this morning. And I'm really looking forward to watching. On I'm Sunday. very excited. Thank um, you. Um, so Trevor Phillips there is going to be a very familiar face, as he already is, uh, on your screens uh, from September's Sunday morning. And I've got another familiar face to bring into the conversation uh, as well, our Deputy Political Editor, uh, Sam Coates, who's joining myself and Trevor. And now, normally on the take, we have you kind of beaming in uh, from South London, um, but we've got you both here in the studio today, which is lovely. And we thought, yeah, we'd have a bit of a chat, I guess, about, you know, politics and about the state we're in and also, I guess, looking back, because it has been... I mean, so I started the show January 2017, and I just cannot actually wow. believe what has happened since then. It's insane. It is. I, I mean, a, a, lot, a lot has changed. We've had entire lifetimes worth of politics just in the period that you've been doing the show. I, I actually think it's worth going back to that first show. You, show, you showed a little bit of it on the screen a few moments ago. Your first show uh, as uh, presenter of Sky's Sunday morning programme, and your first big interview was with... Theresa May. Now, it was a memorable interview on screen, but the story behind that interview and what happens next <laughs> is worth telling, and it's worth telling because it's a story of our times about the relationship between the media and politicians, but it's not my story, it's your story. Sophie, what happened when this interview went on and what happened immediately afterwards? Oh, I can't quite believe Sam is doing this, by the way. Um, <laughs> he has sprung me on this, this on me, just to let you know. Um, so thanks for that, Sam. Lovely to have you on the programme this morning. Um, now get lost. <laughs> well, reading out what Donald Trump had said was um, quite a big deal uh, at the time, and it's something that I thought about very carefully. Um, but actually, I, my sense was that, look, it was something that was very important to do because if you don't say the, use the words and the language that he used, I don't think people really understand why everyone is getting so upset about it. You have to actually say it to understand the story. Um, Theresa May, I thought, handled it pretty well, actually, uh, in that interview. Her team at the time did take a different view. <laughs> they were really unhappy uh, with me, with the team. And after that interview... Yeah, everyone basically stormed out. There was a big row uh, behind, uh, off screen, behind the camera. We then didn't get any government guests at all on that program for, I mean, weeks, months, even. Because um, well, you said the P word. Yeah, because I said the P word. It is extraordinary the way. Which is not ideal if you just started. <laughs> if you just set up a political program and the government aren't giving you any guests, it was a little bit of a. Well, my bit hairy. They, they pulled 
all p political guests from Sky as a whole for a, for a, for a period of time after that yeah. interview. The extra and, and, and that tells you a little bit behind the scenes. Something that's very important, which is that here we are in the heart of Westminster. It's a, it's a bit of a two-way dance. We, you know, it'd be ideal if it wasn't, but everybody uh, has a role to play and everyone can behave well and everyone can behave, frankly, badly. And it does require politicians to want to come on to be mm. held account uh, on Sunday mornings uh, uh, on a channel such as ours. Um, and if they feel things are unfair, then they can withhold their presence. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do that in a way that you know, one might think is legitimate, sometimes, frankly, is a fit of temper. And then what are you meant to do? And viewers at home have to make their minds up, sometimes from an absence of information, from an absence of guests, just as much they do from when somebody's answering, to, uh, answering questions. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it's interesting, because I, I think there's a big, been a big change. When I started in political television, uh, you know, back before the dawn of time, when we used Polaroids and everything, um, uh, <laughs> You, you used to have interviews that were 45 minutes, 50 minutes long, mm. and politicians would jostle to come on. Uh, it seems to me today they actually spend all their time trying to avoid coming on. In those days, they wanted to come on and tell people why they thought, and they would wrestle with you and so on. Whereas now, my sense is that actually they think to, they think, to think talking to the public through mm. us is some kind of torture. I, mean, I personally, I think that's what they get paid for. <laughs> but I, I worry that we're now in a situation where actually uh, democracy is not being served because, to be frank, too many leading politicians are too afraid to tell people what they actually think. Yeah, I think it's right. And also the other thing I would say is that people, are, as you were saying there, Trevor, people, people shy away from longer interviews. Yeah. Like We frequently do 20-minute interviews on, on the programme. And that's better for the viewer, but also it's, it's good for the politician too, because if you have a squeezed interview, then you basically have to just run through all your news runs really quickly. You haven't got space to set out your argument, and the questions that get cut are often the more interesting yeah. questions, the kind of personal questions that end up getting cut. One last thing on that Theresa May uh, interview. Um, just if you thought it wasn't a, a difficult enough morning for me with uh, the big row with number 10, I had the worst morning sickness uh, in that interview as well. Oh, so I was literally yeah. in and out of the toilet the whole of that morning as well. So there you go. Well, that's not, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not going to have that problem with me. Before we, before, before we go, um, just one thing. Sophie, I thought we thought we'd oh give goodness, you a present. Me. This, this is, is ridiculous. This is the best rum in the world. It comes from where my family comes from in Guyana. We've been making it for 400 years. It's El Dorado, 21 years old. And I thought, because you're going to have to, instead of dealing politicians once a week, four times a week, you're going to need that. I am going to need that. I am <laughs> going to need that. That's absolutely right. Trevor, that's so nice of you. Um, thank you so much. And um, it just shows to show what, what a decent guy uh, you are. And honestly, like, I'm, I'm really excited to see. Uh, and we'll be we working together, well. actually. We will. Um, um, absolutely. Can you put that back on the table? Are we allowed like, to? Is yes, this allowed? no, you are. Because um, <laughs> one of the things that we've learned about TV is you have to do quite a lot to make sure it's all authentic and it's all true and what, you know, give the impression that what you're really doing is what you're doing. I'm really scared about where this whole <laughs> segment of the programme is okay. going. Sophie, will you open the box and take out the bottle? Oh, stop it! What are you doing? Yeah, just do it. Uh, Sam, well, we should be talking about politics here. We are. Just, just do, what I, do what I suggest. I'm really worried, actually. No, don't worry, is he? <laughs> what is going to be in I, I know what he's trying to do. But you see... So, because what's happened, on his way in, <laughs> it's half drunk. Trevor has given you a half drunk bottle of Hang on a minute. You will, you will, you'll get the full bottle, but the terror of coming on and being an interviewee, I had to have... I had to have something before I came on. So he said, he said to me on the way in, he was going to buy amazing. another one. He was going to buy another one That's and send a... it to you during the week, but he'd give you the fake one on air. I don't amazing. believe in fakery, Sophie. I think we should be honest. Oh, here honest we go. At all time. Mr. Sincerity. And... <laughs> Mr. Sincerity. So, so, so that, actually, you could just hand it back to him and he'll give you, he's going to send you the real one That's later amazing. in the week. That's actually amazing. So is this a kind of classic Trevor Phillips? I remember one of my favourite kind of political um, pieces of, of information is how a Chancellor is... Can, uh, can deliver, they're allowed in the House of Commons when they deliver big set piece events like budgets to have, you know, a quick drink before. Ken Clark, I think, is the last person to actually do that. No one else uh, has actually done that. Whiskey, yeah. So this is your, uh, is this your uh, technique is, then? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So. <laughs>
8 at 8.30 every Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely going to be worth watching. It's definitely going to be worth watching, isn't it? Um, Sam, you've been in Westminster for a long time as well. Uh, like myself, you kind of witnessed a lot of stuff. We were talking a bit about the sort of Theresa May interview as well. We then kind of went into the era of Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, which was just popul populism politics. You never really knew where those interviews were going to take you. I mean, that was a whole different era, wasn't it? It was. And, you know, for the period that you've been doing the show, the, the news agenda has moved so incredibly fast. It's been hard. To, I mean, it's, it's, it's taken a toll on all of us. We've, um, uh, we were working sort of every hour through a lot of this period as we did elections, Brexit, lots of different sort of democratic events uh, and massive, massive uncertainty on the biggest questions that, uh, that, 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 that Britain could face. And um, no, it was all it was all unpredictable. And there were moments, actually, like the interview you did with Therese Coffey that you showed uh, during the mo montage, where you actually suddenly felt that it, during yeah. the course of a Sunday morning interview with you, you could see the government falling apart. Yeah. It was that moment where Therese Coffey was clearly unable to answer questions about what Boris Johnson knew about Chris Pincher. At that moment where Boris Johnson was already very vulnerable, but yeah. they decided not to sort of plunge the knife in over Partygate, was a moment where you just said, sense, here is a cabinet just despairing. You often get that sense at these kind of high pressure moments in politics when you know that the person put up by number 10 has not been given all the information. And the reason that they have to be given the information is because if that information was out there, it would be a big, big problem for the mm. government. And you can sense it. You can sense it with the Therese Coffey uh, interview. I think, you know, you can sense it around ahead of uh, Nadim Zahari before he was yeah. um, sacked from the government. Um, and again, the kind of Boris Johnson era ones too. I mean, Grant Shapps and Dominic Cummings, I think, is another uh, example of that. You can sense it in the interview that they cannot give you the answers, and you know that actually they it's only a matter of time. They send them out to be a fire blanket, really, don't they? Uh, actually, I wanted to ask the two of you something because actually, since you've been here, Sophie, um, one of the unusual things is that there's been always been one story completely dominating to start with Brexit, uh, then um, uh, COVID, and mm. then Ukraine, and. How difficult has it been to sort of c create new things or uh, not to find yourself asking the same question of everybody every week? I think that's really true. And also, like, look, these are huge issues that did just suck all the life and all the oxygen, if you like, out of Westminster at those times. And it is quite important to get out there and make sure that other stories are being covered. I think, to be honest, we have a bit of a responsibility for it going forward that I think you will definitely do on Sunday, and I certainly hope to do as well uh, with the new uh, programme at 7pm on Sky, um, which is our kind of new daily political uh, programme. We need to start looking at some of those, like you were saying, outside bubble stories that are really important, because it feels that actually the state of the nation and everyone will feel it, whether it's their mortgage payments uh, or whether mm. it's the mm. state of their hospitals or whatever it is. We need to be talking about this stuff and, and as journalists as well and making sure that we're covering it too. And there's an alienation outside of London because we have been talking yeah. to each other and it's looked like we've been talking to each other for the best part of seven years. And um, I've been going out talking to politicians around bits of the north mm. of England and, and, and there is a sort of rage about how much parts of the country have been ignored. And that's not just through the levelling up conversation, which actually has become a kind of rather trite SW1 conversation in and of itself. It doesn't really reflect the kind of sense that uh, parts of the country don't feel that policing works for mm. them, local government works for them, schooling is working particularly effectively. There, there is a sense that um, because we've been focused inwards, we're not dealing with the big challenges. And, and that's where the contrast, I think, between Tony Blair and Keir Starmer comes in. It's that sense that the former Prime Minister was talking to some of the big issues, as you say, but sometimes Keir Starmer is responding a little bit too much to the sort of day-to-day -day that's that, that, that's going in, triangulating to try and stop a row with a faction and uh, and worried about um, putting himself too far out there on, on, on certain issues or promising uh, too big a sort of... Th there's a little bit of, of, of politics by rote and by numbers during the lessons of the past. Mm -hmm. I think that people will respond when they believe what you say. And, and, and we come back to this <coughs> point about being good at putting yourself out there as a politician. Mm. 
because those politicians that do the short interviews or rely on social media to get their message out and aren't really tested and can't really answer the questions and sound convincing sitting here opposite you, they're the ones that kind of come unstuck, come unpicked mm. when yeah. they're in the very top jobs. Mm. Trevor, can I ask you a couple of questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be nice one. Well, Sophie, I do <laughs> I mean, uh, what you really want to say. <laughs> I love it. Um, who would your, if you could kind of wave a magic wand, who, who would be your perfect guests for your new programme when you come here in September? Well, I guess it, it depends on, on the week, uh, but I guess... Uh, I used to work for a, a television company which had big talk shows, and the guy who produced the biggest, biggest talk show at the start, start of every season would write up on the board the people they wanted. And every season, the first name would be The Pope. <laughs> the second, <laughs> second name would be The Queen. <laughs> so I, I, th I guess that's where I'm going to start, uh, with The Pope. Um, but I think the next couple of years is going to be fascinating. All the party leaders, um, when I was here sitting in for you, um, I never got to talk to either Johnson or Starmer, and I hope that will be remedied. And, of course, don't let's forget, we're going to have big ele American elections next year. Mm -hmm. And the person I'm really interested in there, in actually, is not so much the president, but Kamala Harris, mm, who could be the leader of the free world within two or three... I mean, I don't want to wish anybody harm, but in reality, that's what Americans are going to be voted on. So... Um, We'll be talking about that. But actually, I also want to talk to business leaders. I want to talk to community leaders outside. And that, let's not forget Scotland. Mm. You know, in the next four or five years, Scotland is still going to be a major issue for this country. So, um, And Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland. And Wales. So I think we need to be reaching out uh, there and having those people on. I mean, going, I mean, you know, I hope... Uh, that I'm going to get some of them, because I know you're going to be soaking all these people up on Monday, yeah, Tuesday, We're going to be in competition in Trevor. <laughs> we're going to be like, fastest fingers first on, the, yeah. on, the, on WhatsApp to try and make sure who we get. Um, there's going to be lots of space, I'm sure, and it's going to yeah. be such a big political year as well. Yeah. Um, It'll be ahead. huge. It's going to be huge. Um, so I think it's really exciting, actually, that we're going to be kind of ramping up our political coverage, um, and you're obviously going to be a big part of that as well, Sam. Um, well, thanks. Um, thanks for coming in. It's been really fun. It's been great to have you uh, as well, Trevor, and I'm really excited about uh, watching. Thank you, Sophie. I mean, as a viewer, thank you. Oh, no, well, that's really kind. Uh, well, if you hadn't had enough from us, I mean, that was, a bit, that was a bit... Well, thank you for bearing with us. It was a lot of fun for us. I hope it was fun for you at home as well. Uh, the Sophie Ridge on Sunday podcast is also going to be available later with well, some of our interviews from today. Plus, there'll be discussion with myself, uh, with Trevor, and also with our show editor, Scott Beasley. Wherever you get your podcast, that should be available early afternoon. Well, now that really is it. Uh, that was the last Sophie Ridge on Sunday. I would like to say a really big thank you to the team behind the camera, uh, Scott Beasley and Lucy Bishop, uh, as always, uh, the people who do the really hard work uh, every week. It feels a bit emotional. Um, thank you as well to every single one of you uh, for giving me an hour and a half of your Sunday mornings. I've absolutely never taken that for granted. Trevor Hill Phillips will be here from Sunday from September. And remember, do join me, 7pm weeknights from September 2. I would absolutely love to have your time. Thank you. <laughs>